Hello, people of the internet. My name is Johnny, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. This is the second one today. Before this video, I posted a reaction to the FNAF Big Band song. Not gonna lie, it slapped hard. If you missed it, it'll be linked down below, and there should be an iCard right up there. Now, this is yet another game theory reaction. This came out yesterday, and originally, normally, I would make a reaction to it the day it came out. But I was doing a charity stream yesterday. Which, the best part about it is that it spans the entire week. So, link down below is the donation page. Please, boys, go donate. So, all I know about this game theory is that it tackles the Fazbear Fanverse initiative. I really hope he doesn't try to connect the fan games to the main story lore because that is just going to be very, very complicated, and honestly, I don't think I would want him to do that. I guess the only way to find out what he's going to be talking about is to watch the video itself. So, let's not waste any more time, and let's hop right into it. Okay, this is Game Theory FNAF The New Breed. Again, it's about the initiative, that's all I really know about it. So, if you're new here, subscribe, because I do so many reactions to game theory. I do reactions to all the FNAF episodes, so if you don't want to miss the next one, subscribing is the best way. So, let's not waste any more time, and let's hop into it. Hey, Matt, how we doing? Ugh, lame. I feel like he's done this gag before, but I'll go with it. Boring. Been there, done that one. Guys, guys, huddle up. Y'all here? I swear he's done this. Um, At this point, there's more of you than there are Pokemon species. Uh, paper plate people. Here. Obscure lore-filled egg baby. Here. Jar of True. Pickles. Great. Listen up, everyone. Y'all have a big problem on your hands. You all are yesterday's news. People know about you. They survived you. They remember True. you. Well, except for you, egg baby. Long story short, guys, people know what to expect of you. To be scary, you need to be unexpected, new, unpredictable. And that's why, gentle bears and lady <laughs> chicks, I introduce you to the new breed. Ah. Welcome to the family, guys. Interesting. So yeah, it's about the initiative. It's been a while since he's used this intro. It's always been like a custom FNAF one. But I, I I'm I'm down. Hello, Hello internet. internet. Welcome, Welcome to Game Theory. Theory. The show where my waistline is extending faster than the FNAF universe. When it comes to Five Nights at Freddy's, I know, I didn't know no that. small deal about how huge this franchise has gotten. I mean, if you're looking to keep up with all the lore, this year, 2020 alone is home to not one, but five new book releases. As if seven main games, four spin-offs, and the still-in-the-works movie weren't enough. But there was an announcement made by Scott earlier this year that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. An announcement that... To Interesting. Me, is it just important to this franchise, but is important for all of gaming? Between all my jokes about mm. how much I hate the franchise and how complex the lore has gotten, I've always said that the way Scott has crafted these games and how he's managed to run his community is perhaps the smartest, most modern way of making a video game. From the very first Five Nights game, he understood that the current age of gaming is all about sharing your experiences, that no two playthroughs should ever be alike, that obscure screen screens, jump scares, glitches, minigames, all of it should appear very small with very small probabilities so that people can go online and ask their friends, wait, D did you see that? Was this a real thing? <laughs> From the first appearance of Golden Freddy in the newspaper clippings in FNAF 1, all the way up to Help Wanted surprise hey, coffee. coffee from his early game The Desolate Hope, these sorts of things form the lifeblood of this franchise. That is what gets people talking about your game, and sharing your game, and sharing videos of your game. And yet, it's a game design feature that shockingly modern developers just don't seem to do. True, all that's actually, yeah. The micro scale. Today, we're zooming out to talk about the big picture. <laughs> Another move that Scott's made that completely bucks the trend of modern game development and truly embraces what it means to lead a successful franchise in 2020 and <laughs> beyond, in space. The age of creators and Truly, he's controls. now in space. I'm speaking, of course, about the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative, something Scott announced back in August of this year. Such a in banger Facebook title, too. This thing. Here's a quote from the Reddit post. There have been some great fan-made spin-off in this community, and I want to see them keep going. That's why 
put some of my own cash toward development of new games in those game series. Scott However, is I'm going just to stay the best. Out of the development side of things so that these creators can do their thing. They're going to develop these games and interact with the fan base just as they would have normally. And when the games are done, they'll be released on Game Jolt for free just like normal. The difference now is that they'll also be bundled up yes. with other games and sold on most major consoles. I get excited every well. time At least that's the people point. talk about the I initiative. There may be some toys and other merchandise of these fan oh. games too. It's a project that's designed oh God, to invest so in those franchises, give back to the developers, and hopefully bring new entries to those franchises as well. So the TLDR version of this, Scott's pulling a reverse Nintendo. He's <laughs> True. <and extreme laughs> yes. Fan games. He's investing in them, helping them with distribution, and heck, maybe even merch. The first wave of this initiative involves five titles. Five Nights at Candy's 4, which, you know, is just FNAF, but with cats. Pop Goes Evergreen, <laughs> which is, you know, FNAF with rodents. One Night at Flumpty's, which is FNAF with eggs. The Joy yes. Creation, which is Love FNAF me some eggs. on fire. And FNAF <laughs> Plus, which is, well, it's just FNAF. Plus. That is obviously a big simplification of all these games just for the joke, but you get the point here. They're all spin-off games with the basis of Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, all of this sounds well and good, right? I mentioned it that it seemed like Scott Cawthon was taking the initiative to embrace and extend existing fan works. And those are words with warm and fuzzy vibes, but they're also words that have, well, they have themselves a history that's a lot less warm and fuzzy oh, than boy. you think. Thanks to a third E that's less mentioned, Extinguish. That might sound harsh and seem like it's coming out of nowhere, so let me explain what I mean with all this. I think it's necessary to talk about another company that publicly took the embrace and extend approach and what it meant for the evolution of an industry and how Scott is taking a similar approach but turning it on its head. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a lesson on everyone's favorite game Oh boy, let's go! Antitrust law. Antitrust law <laughs> My seems favorite. to be a hot topic <laughs> these days, with Facebook robot Mark Zuckerberg and Twitter CEO <laughs> Jack Dorsey getting grilled in front of Congress this year not just once, but twice. Well, big it might oof. be a trending topic in 2020. Big tech companies getting taken to task for monopolistic and anti-competitive business practices is nothing new. Back in the 90s, before companies like Google and Twitter and Facebook were but a twinkle in some source code's eye, the tech giant that everyone had their sights on was Microsoft. And oh mind boy. you, this was <laughs> almost a decade before anyone had even heard of an Xbox. This is back in the days of Internet Explorer, who, oof. let me tell you, was facing some fierce competition from the likes of Chrome? Firefox? <laughs> Heck no, this is the 90s, baby. Their competition looked a lot more like Netscape, Navigator, and Mosaic. And I don't think I've heard of those. To some, uh, huh. Not so pleasant, and as it turns out, not so legal tactics in order to edge out the competition. This During doesn't the 90s, sound good. Microsoft was public about their strategy of embrace and extend. The basic idea is that you start by finding something that someone else has made, like a technology <laughs> standard, a protocol, or a tool of some kind, and say, cool, we're going to embrace it. <laughs> It and start using cool. it ourselves. And then you extend upon it by saying, well, this thing that someone else made is cool and all, but we're going to make it even bigger and better. We're going to build our own proprietary technology on top of it, and people can begin using our version of that old standard. Steve Ballmer, who at hmm. the time was the executive vice president <laughs> like of Microsoft name. and went on to be president and later CEO, described it in an interview with the New York Times. Quote, new products and services should simply be extensions of the old. Whether it's me or the guy who replaces me because we don't do well, we'll keep coming and we will do well. Yeah, I'd say you did pretty well for yourself, Microsoft, and largely interesting quote. Embrace and extend motto. Heck, according to one article I read, a Microsoft employee even wrote a song titled The Battle Hymn of the Reorg that ended with that exact phrase. Uh, the song goes a little something like this Oh, our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the net. We are ramping up our market share. Objectives will be met. Soon our browser will be everywhere. You ain't seen nothing. And yet we embrace and we extend. Man, Catchy. I was nerdy. On its face, uh -huh. the policy of embracing and extending tools and protocols made by other people Great seems memes. generous, right? You're adding to what's already there. But what this hides is the fact that once you take an existing standard and extend it with your own proprietary technology, you own the oh. part that you're adding. And not only that, you're replacing the original public open standard with your own version that you alone have control over. 
over, effectively hmm. taking ownership okay. over a standard that someone else created. And when Microsoft talked publicly about the first two E's, there was a hidden third E that they didn't like to mention in public, extinguish. Because once you've extended the Kinda old standard scary, the boys. proprietary editions, having effectively hijacked something that someone else had made, you now have control that you can use to extinguish the competition. <laughs> By the way, that third E, extinguish, e. isn't just speculation on the part of Microsoft haters. Though Microsoft never talked about it publicly for obvious reasons, an investigation by <laughs> yeah, the that probably would have been bad. Justice found that the motto extend, embrace, extinguish was used in Microsoft internal communications. And <gasps> considering that the entire court case centered around the fact that Microsoft was allegedly using anti-competitive practices to bar other companies from competing with them, the <laughs> fact that they were literally trying to extinguish the competition didn't work all that well in their favor. Pro yeah. Tip, if you have a business strategy that's evil and illegal, try not to use words that make it sound evil and illegal. And then don't use it in company emails, you doof. The Microsoft example is a bit Pro technical, tips with but it's Pat. easy to see examples of a similar strategy used in the entertainment world Denny. at Disney. Rather than creating their own original stories, they began by embracing folk tales and classic stories in the public domain, like Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, and The Little Mermaid. No hmm. problems there. They were open and available for anyone to use. Then, they extended these classic fairy tales by creating their own animated versions of these stories with their own spins on them. But then they effectively extinguished competition by replacing the original work with their own. And when it comes wow. to protecting their own characters and copyright, Disney is fiercely controlled. Oh, yeah. Unlike Microsoft, Disney has managed to do this without breaking any laws. Uh, technically speaking, they just lobby to change the copyright laws. <laughs> Mickey Mouse is a 92-year-old character at this point. Damn. Should technically be in the public domain by now, except for the fact that the laws seem to mysteriously change every time his copyright is set to expire. <laughs> Strange coincidence, hmm. huh? Could possibly have anything to do with the millions of dollars nope. that Disney's spending to lobby Congress no way. every time it happens. Definitely it happens. not. There is nope. some serious <laughs> irony in the fact that Disney has worked so hard to prevent their characters from entering the public domain, despite the fact that they began as a company by creating their own versions of classic public domain Kinda stories. Kinda awkward taco. Cases, Disney's versions of these stories have effectively replaced the originals in the public consciousness. Oh, yeah. Which, I gotta say, is a shame considering I personally want to re-experience the original Little Mermaid's ending. Where, you know, she's given a dagger and has to choose to murder the prince or herself. And the Red Sea at sunset is actually the result of her blood pouring out into the water. Yep, that is the original story. Can't Yay! Why people would prefer the Disney version. Anyway, it's not all that <laughs> surprising that you go to the book section of Amazon and search for classic fairy tales like Cinderella. The first thing that pops up is a Disney coloring book. Look at Disney! really hard to make sure that their version of the story is the only version of the story that matters. So a is little... Scott Cawthon guilty of oh, yes, back to FNAF. funding fan projects might seem like a generous gesture, but is this really part of his plan for world domination? No. Well, the short answer Not my boy. is no. In fact, yes. the strategy might at first appear to have some superficial similarities with the behavior of Microsoft in the 90s. You can actually argue that he's doing the exact opposite of the business practices That's my that boy. companies like Microsoft and Disney. And this applies to basically every step in the process. For instance, Microsoft worked by embracing public <laughs> standards or products that other people had created, and Disney worked by embracing fairy tales and folk stories from the public domain. They were effectively targeting things that other people had created. But here, Scott is honing in on what's effectively Let's his go. territory to begin Let's with. Go. Scott's own work is the foundation on which these fan creations were made. They exist with his blessing. This is something that we talked about. <laughs> in <the NAF> fan <laughs> what a great freeze frame. The short of it is that while Scott doesn't have the rights to publish work created by fans without their permission, fans don't have the rights to publish work based on his characters without his permission. All the fan creators are working with Scott's blessing, but ultimately, it's his characters and intellectual property to do with as he pleases. He's not capturing someone else's folklore <laughs> and planting his flag in it to claim ownership over it. His flag was already there to begin with. Oh and god, more, Freddy he's Planet. He's doing this with the full consent of the fan creators, which brings us to the second E, Extend. Rather than trying to extend <laughs> these sake. fan works for himself in a way that would allow him to claim creative ownership over them the way that Microsoft did, he's leaving the power in the hands of the fan creators and letting them be the ones to extend their own fan lore. And lastly, Yay. the third E. Extend. Gotta hate that. Once again, it feels like Scott's doing the <laughs> terrible image. Of the original E E E strategy. Rather than trying to quash other so creators <laughs> so that the only thing left in the space is his original FNAF games, the entire point of this initiative is to include and promote other creators who can offer their fan games as an alternative.
alternative. Not satisfied with only seven official FNAF games? Here, only seven? That's it. Made. And now, you can check them out on more platforms since they're coming to consoles and smartphones and Scott Cawthon has given them the development resources to make it happen. Let's so, go. yeah, I think that far from being an example of a monopolistic business trying to control everything, this is an example of the opposite. Rather than being overprotective with his <laughs> IP and issuing a Scott with a mustache. Who tries to create their own <laughs> fan game or spin on his creation, Scott is doing the opposite. He's giving the Yay. fan community's biggest developers even more resources, all while letting them have control over their own products. If all of this is starting to sound like one big puff piece and you're feeling ripped off that you got this far into a video without any tea being Listen, spilled, sorry, the drama I... you're looking for is in another castle. Because this <laughs> Love me, watching videos about like Scott being awesome. Games industry. In the internet age, this age of social media, we are a culture of remixers. We meme, we take other people's Pog. activity, we build a Can I get some we Pog champs in the comments? Make our own original eh? works via fan art, via fan fiction. And that is something that should be welcome, embraced. If your product is important enough in someone's life that they want to develop their own version of it, they want to show their <laughs> own fandom by doing their own video, game, whatever, that is a compliment. You hire them, you bless their work, you be a mentor to them, whatever <laughs> it is. I can't help but think about Sonic Mania, which was created yes. by a team known for their work in the Sonic fan game and ROM hack communities. And Sega gave them the keys to the kingdom to produce what's probably the best canonical Sonic game in recent history. Now contrast Got a point Scott there. and Sega's behavior with Nintendo. Banning Oof. Twitch live streams that were paid for and played on release day. Shutting down fan games because they were worried about it competing with their own products. Shutting down tournaments run by people that are still really passionate about a multiplayer game that was originally released Three in melee, boys. One. Sorry to pick on you, Nintendo, but I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think it was deserved. These are bad moves. When games True. like Pokemon Uranium or another Metroid 2 remake come out, you just kill them. You stomp on them. What could be and are in many cases fully fleshed out games. I remember playing Uranium. You spent years putting them together out of a love for your work. You put them through a shredder. Congratulations, you protected your IP, but you killed the love of your community in the process. And from a purely financial standpoint, heck, you could have just embraced those projects. Could have hired those people on. You yeah. Them up a little bit. You had two quick and easy money makers. If you're thinking about it from just the pure cold hearted dollars and cents, that is money you left on the table. Period. I'm sorry. Times have changed and the industry needs to change with them. With so many scummy, exploitative, yes. and downright what a great way to end. That I love this. Industry, <laughs> this is amazing. The, stories, the companies that are doing it right. And if we're able to recognize the more positive examples of how some companies are able to succeed by doing the right thing, maybe we can get just a little bit more of that sort of thing. FNAF is a huge yes. example of a game that isn't just a game. It's a community of fans that pour tremendous amounts of love and effort into making their own content. Whether it's the Let's Play videos that first... Hello, everybody. My name is days, Mark People that have gone the extra mile and been inspired to create their own fan games. The Fazbear Fanverse Initiative is a great example of what can happen when fans love a game franchise. And the franchise is willing to love them back. I just wish more people were paying attention. But yes. hey, that's just a theory. <laughs> I got the cinematic in this. Game theory. Thanks for watching. Wow. What a great ending. Um, that was fantastic ending. That was a really good way to end that episode. Frick you, Nintendo. Scott, you are the best human being on the earth. You are goddamn incredible. So unlike some of the other FNAF Game Theory episodes where Matt talks about the lore and the books, there's not really much for me to touch upon here because I think he actually did a very, very good job at explaining everything. Normally, I get a little upset when the content of the video switches from FNAF to Mad Pat going to different topics, like Microsoft. When he started to get into Microsoft, I was like, okay, I get we need background, but this is kind of a bit much. But honestly, the more I watched the video, the more I was like, you know what? He's making some banger points right here. This was a good episode. And then the thing at the end, amazing. Honestly, freaking what a great way to end that episode. Attack and Nintendo, which, to be fair, some people may find harsh, but when you look at what they've been doing recently, it's not looking good for them. You know, Nintendo, not looking like a very good company right now. Um, and then the final message of the community and Scott all coming together being just a freaking amazing fandom. That was sweet. I really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, this was a very good episode. Not much to talk about because, again, he did a lot of great explaining. He hit on, on, on a lot of good points. 
and overall, a very good episode. I was a little confused, not confused, I just really was not expecting a initiative video. I didn't know what he would talk about in here, but honestly, I think this was great. <laughs> Again, I, I've been saying it, but honestly, a really good episode of Game Theory. So, that's really it. Thanks for watching. Again, if you missed my reaction to the FNAF Big Band song, it's linked down below. Same thing with my Tiltify, raising money for hashtag Thankmas. And if you made it to the end of the video, you liked it. And if you haven't liked it already, you probably should, as well as subscribing so you don't miss my next reaction to Game Theory. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all on the flip side. Goodbye. Gregory, be still. I think she's found us. <laughs>